Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you are joining us from. Welcome to Live from the Ranch. We are joining you now in a new format. If you've been with us in previous years, uh, we used to be on Zoom, but now we have moved to YouTube Live and Facebook Live, and hopefully all of you are able to see us well. I'm so glad you're here. My co-host, as is the case every month, is Juliana DeWillems with JW Dog Training and Behavior in the Washington, D.C. area. Hey, Juliana, how are you? I'm great, Ken. It's great to be back after both of our months of travels. You just came back from a big trip, didn't you? I did. If you follow me on Instagram, I, I, I posted once in a while. I went to uh, uh, on an Antarctic expedition and got to see Gen 2 penguins and chin strap penguins, Magellanic penguins and king penguins. We saw a lot whales and I saw lots of ice and glaciers. Uh, Antarctica is a pretty spectacular place. And so um, if you want to see my pictures, just go to go to my uh, Instagram account and you'll be able to see. I was down there for a couple of weeks and had a had a great time. But you were traveling as well. You were in Costa Rica, I noticed on your Instagram feeds. I was for not quite as long. I went for a week, but it was incredible. We also so, saw quite a bit of wildlife. It's pretty remarkable to see sloths, macaws, monkeys, yeah. like in the wild. That's it was cool. crazy. Very cool experience. Well, it's great that we both got to take a little vacation. So that's wonderful. Well, I'm glad to hear that, but I'm really excited about our guest this week. What we're going to talk about this week is we're going to talk about dog reactivity just a little bit. And uh, I'm really excited that my guest is Emma Parsons, who's been with us on Live from the Ranch before. She is currently the canine behavior and training consultant for Surefire Dogs in Westboro, Massachusetts. She specializes in managing and rehabilitating the reactive and aggressive dog. She's authored three books on the subject, including the newest book, uh, The New Click to Calm Solutions for All Dogs in a Challenging World. Emma's a faculty member both of the Karen Pryor Academy as well as for Karen Pryor Clicker Expos. And she's been teaching reactive dog classes for 12 years at Masterpiece Dog Training in Franklin, Massachusetts. Hello, Emma, welcome to Live from the Ranch. How are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm so glad you could come back and join us. I, I, I think that uh, the issue of dog reactivity and dog aggression never gets old because unfortunately we all deal with it from time to time. Um, and uh, did you, when you first got into dog training, did you ever imagine yourself being thought of as an expert on dog reactivity and aggression? Absolutely not. That's what I <laughs> <laughs> it's not one of those I struggled things that, with that and thought, I'm yeah. so done with this. <laughs> yeah, so I, I know that the, the thing that sort of got you in this direction was uh, the, the, the story of Ben, your reactive golden retriever, who sort of, you went to Karen Pryor and got her help and she started making suggestions that sort of led you down this path to uh, the click to calm methodology, yeah. which is something that you talk about a lot and, you, you know, uh, your first book was Click to Calm, but the new Click to Calm, which just came out last year, has got so many updates in it. And then you also published a, had a book come out called Teaching the Reactive Dog Class, which uh, uh, really helped people look at how to use some of these technologies. So it really seems to be something that you've devoted so much of your time to. It seems to me, though, that a lot of times when people are dealing with uh, reactive dogs, one of the first things that most of us learn somewhere in our dog training learning is we, we learn a little bit about using classical conditioning and, and just trying to uh, condition the animal to, to get used to the thing that scares them. Is, is, is that how you first started dealing or trying to deal with reactivity was using some kind of classical conditioning approach or did you start with a more operant approach or did you do both? I had Karen prior with me, thank goodness. Um, she wanted me to start right with the clicker, clicking and feeding. The hard part with Ben is that he would not eat. So it took him a good at least month and a half to start eating. But what she would say is if I could somewhat time the click correctly, that eventually he would start to eat. And then when he did, we would actually see um, some real big improvement with that behavior, which did end up being true. Um, I said that because it was very disheartening for me at that point, because up until that point, I had tried 
I mean, everything one could do with food, you know, and then even things without food, like, you know, well, if a friend holds him and is exposed to a dog, would he still react the same way? But, but he would, and it didn't seem to matter whether the dog was two feet away from him or 200 feet away from him. So it was very difficult at that point um, to determine how to, how to move with him, how to move forward. Um, so when I met Karen, she, you know, the process was so different. And in all honesty, back then, I thought, how is this little clicker going to work with this dog that I can't reach, you know? Um, but what she had explained is that as we start to mark that fear, that it almost, and I think of it as chopping up that reactivity in, in, in tiny pieces. I think what happens is when a dog is, um, exposed to the challenging stimulus, I, I feel like that there's a reactive wall that goes up, you right. know, and, and depending upon how intense that behavior is, is how thick that wall is. So I can get in there with classical conditioning if their dog will actually eat, you know, I can get in there um, and you start to, I think of it as poke holes in that wall. Uh, with Ben, there was, you know, the clicker itself, I think, was poking those holes. And I got to tell you, in the beginning, I mean, there were, were, I mean, he would just go on and on. And there was no real peace that I could consciously think of reinforcing with him. But as she said, and exactly what happened is that the more I did it, the more I started to notice that there were little, little tiny pieces of silence starting to open up. And then when that started to happen, then he started eating. So I knew that I had turned a corner. I think one of the challenges that so many people face when they're dealing with reactivity is that the reactivity can be such a huge reaction and they're often looking for these quick fixes and it doesn't change quickly. That, that idea that the dog is over threshold and you're throwing them food and the food just lands on the floor because they're so uh right. reactive it, and it, it discourages people really really um really quickly because they feel like they're not making progress um how did you get over that initial discouragement because you didn't have immediate success when when you first started right you you, you were working with karen sh as she coached you through it right. you came right. back to her and said this isn't yeah. working yeah exactly i i would call her because you know um she would give me her number and i didn't want to abuse it of course but, you know, when we're two weeks in, I would call her and say, I mean, I don't I, I don't know what I, I don't know what I'm clicking. I don't know that it's working because he's still not eating. And what she explained to me is that unconsciously she thought it was working and to keep going. And of course, back then I knew nothing really about learning theory, as I know today. And I just thought, well you know what, this is his last hope. So I'm going to do exactly as, and, and she was right, you know, step forward about three and a half weeks or so, you know, he did start eating, you know, that glazy look at the direction. And that was really big because when I saw that he was going to start eating, then I felt hope for the first time. Right. And from that day forward, he definitely, did better and better as and, the training continued. And can I ask a question? I want to clarify for people. When you say he started eating, it isn't that yeah. he completely focused on you and ate like in a normal session. Oh. He would eat and then go back and bark no. again, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, well, right. I mean, in the beginning, I mean, I was giving him all kinds of disgusting talk. And I even went... fries and all these other things. But in the beginning, I was literally clicking and there was nothing there. And then as he did start eating, that is what I saw. I would click, he would eat a treat or two, and then he'd go back to bark. Uh, you know, originally we have to remember he would bark, he would growl. He would. Um, he would say he would salivate from both sides of his mouth. His half hackles would be up. Sometimes he would bare his teeth. And if I left him in the environment long enough, because I was also playing with what I can do, he'd start to vomit. So I mean, th these wow. were big. 
you know, uh, things that were happening. So when I started to just see him bark and then stop for a second, get his cookies and, you know, bark again, right there, there was a reduction of a lot of those cues that I had seen originally and why so many people had seen him and thought, you know, you can waste your time. You can think about training him, but you know, this dog is far gone. Yeah. And, um, and that's one reason why I wrote my book because yeah. I also thought maybe I was out on a limb, you know, and, um, but it did work. And once we, you know, once he started really learning consciously, I mean, if you would have told me that within a year, he'd be able to go into a dog training environment with 50 dogs in it, I would say, you know what, I'm just going to quit now yeah. because that's never going to happen. No, that's, so that's, that's it really a, is quite amazing. It is. And I, I really encourage people that uh, I've seen some chat in the in the chat window asking which book. The one that, that we're talking about is the new Click to Calm. Of course, there was the uh, the original book, this one, the Click to Calm book. But I would I would encourage people to, to, to get the new version because you really learned a lot over the 15 years between books and yeah. give some really good recommendations on things that are different. And in the end, when I look at your procedure, which we can't talk about all the complexities of the procedure today, you, it isn't really an entirely operant procedure and it isn't an entirely classical procedure. You have elements of both operant and classical conditioning that are a part of it. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and, 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 and about some of the, the, the ways you uh, use classical conditioning in your click to calm approach? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so usually, you know, I try to give my client what their dog needs. So if I have a dog that's going to eat and let's say there is a dog who's barking out the window, I will have my client just, you know, feed the dog right in the beginning. Just be beside the dog and feed, 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 feed to see what that does to the behavior. If I have a dog like Ben who needs a marker signal and needs a sound that will kind of cut through that reactive wall, then I go right to the clicker as long as the dog is not afraid of it. If the dog is afraid of it, I will have them use a sound of some kind that the dog finds appropriate. So for example, not too long ago, I had a dog that was afraid of the clicker, but not afraid of a squeaker. And because the dog likes squeaky toys, every time we squeaked, it was, it was almost like, you know, the dog was, you know, oh, I need to react to that challenging thing that I'm looking at, but that squeak makes me so happy. So I'm going to turn and get my cookies. So that actually worked really well because of that emotional context that that particular sound, um, you know, brought forth for the dog. Um, so I basically start where I can because my students want as less complicated as possible, right? right? And they want kind of the easiest thing to do. Um, and I always give them a choice. They certainly could use a verbal marker. I've just found um, from my dog, my Joshua, who's unilaterally deaf, the click, for whatever reason, he couldn't perceive that sound very well at all. So with him, I'm using this, um, I'm using a verbal marker, but it's in a certain tone that he can perceive, right? So when I work with him, I say, yes, it has this yes to it. Um, and he picks that up quite nicely. And actually that really turned, helped him turn a corner. So, um, so yeah, knowing how to use all these different uh, methodologies really help for us who see dogs with these issues. We can really fine tune uh, their process for them. And that leads to dogs who learn faster. And, and you use you don't start at the same place for every dog. And I think that's one of the things that's important no. for people to understand. What's really great about yes. the click to call methodology and the reason we can't really talk about all of it today is that you try to meet right. your learner where they are and you start at different right. places. You, you have one of your yes. young dog's spirit with you today. Can you give us an example of Thank one you. of the exercises that you, you, you do for some of your clients? Yeah, so one of the things that's really, um, really, really common, although can I just say clients call me for this, but it's always an issue. Um, so one of the biggest, when they're looking out of a window,
talk about how we're going to deal with that. And then I, I always say to my client, well, you know, we have to make sure they don't rehearse this behavior uh, on a day to day basis, because this, you know, it's the same reactive behavior, whether it's, whether it's in the house looking out a window or whether it's on a leash. So they say, oh my goodness, you know what? My dog always barks out of the window. So, um, so, so that is a really nice place to start. So what I'm going to show is a little demo. Um, this is going to be with Spirit, who's my 13-month-old golden retriever. And um, I have here, because I don't really have a window that I can expo this expose to the front of my house, I have a chair set up so that I can kind of do a, an, you know, an enact reenactment of what it would look like. Um, what typically, if I don't show my clients exactly what I'm explaining, they tend to do this. They tend to have, the, let's say the dog goes to the window. The dog's barking at the window. So if I say, okay, feed your dog or click and feed your dog at the window looking out, what they tend to do is stay back. The dog's in the window in front of them and they call the dog to them and then start feeding. Or what they do is they click and then you know, if the dog comes, they start feeding. So the reason why I wanted to talk about the, this particular thing is that that is not the way that I would suggest working it. What I want my clients to do is go right to the window with the dog and actually feed them one treat after another. And that way we're poking a lot more holes in that reactive wall as we would be if the dog would of us and i don't want the student to think oh my gosh look it's not working and i don't want the, them to use the clicker as, as a recall cue because that's what starts happening and i don't want them to do that so i'm going to get um spirit rain up on the chair and i'm just going to do just a couple of demos with her and i gotta tell you she's she really doesn't go on top of the chair. We just learned this today. Okay. So, um, before I'm, you I, before you before you do the session, Emma, I want you to yeah. know that we've lost uh, we've lost the connectivity to your other computer. So I don't think we'll be able to see your session from that computer unless you either can get get it reconnected or okay. maybe you can focus the computer you're on now so that we can see what you're doing because uh, we've lost the connectivity. Okay, let me see what I can do here. You know, ladies Wait, and gentlemen, those of second. you watching, we have the best of intentions as we put several computers together. I know some of you are experiencing some dropout from Emma, and we're trying to work on that. But in the meantime, um, uh, we are aware that that's there, and that's uh, just it's a difficulty with the uh, internet connection right now, apparently, from where Emma is at. Can you, can you see it now on the other computer? Uh, let's uh, give it a try. Let's uh, take a look. And uh, no, I'm not sure. Uh, we've lost. It's not. We don't have you uh, connected at all. But we've oh, lost that God. that computer completely. We don't have it here on our end at all. So you, this is the only computer that we have access to right now, Emma. Okay. So oh, tell me if you can see me. Is that okay? Yeah, I think so. I see your I see your working space. I see the chair. Yeah. Okay. This is spirit. Okay. What they tend to do is they would stay way back here and they would call their dog to them. Okay? But you know, when the dogs are run barking, this is not what we want to do, right? So I want like to come right up spirit is at the window and i want them to come in and feed if the dog is looking elsewhere i want them to bring the cookie right into the mouth and see if we can get the dog first focused on the tree okay i think we dropped one good girl come on up Okay, so if we have a dog that is really, really reactive, I want to see if we have a dog that can't do the cookies. What we'll do is come back down and I will have them come up again. And I'm going to click. And usually I will click and do a cookie, click 
and do a cookie. Again, if the head is there, I'm going to have them take the mouth and bring it in. And then you know, no rule that says that we can't click once. And I give my dog several cookies at once. Okay, but I want the client right up there at the window. Okay, okay, good girl. Um, That's really nice. Did you see that okay? Yeah, I can see it really well. Okay, okay good. So, um, so eventually, you know, the dog will see the, the distraction out of the window and then the dog will go find their person and say, hey, look, there's the neighbor getting in their car. Aren't you gonna give me some cookies? But we have to start really, really, really close. Right. And that's, we also that's... want to make sure that the client, I was just going to say, we also want to make sure that the client's dog knows what the clicker means. Right. And I think that's a beautiful example. And one of the things that I think confuses some people is some people go, but if you're using a clicker, is there really classical conditioning going on? And really, what I think people need to remember is that classical conditioning and operant conditioning work together and they're both taking together. place the clicker is is for yeah. the behavior uh that you're looking for but meanwhile the the constant pairing of the scary thing outside the window with the food ends up working classically and together they're what help change that behavior right exactly well, good. Well, you know yeah. what? I want to continue this discussion, but one of the things that's important to us is that we thank our sponsors. So I'm going to do a quick uh, uh, a promotion here. And this is something that everybody is very familiar with that I talk about all the time, and that's Clicker Expo, Washington, D.C. Emma's going to be speaking at Clicker Expo. I will be at Clicker Expo. Today is your last chance to register to come to Clicker Expo in Washington, D.C. That's coming up later this month, March 17th, 18th, and 19th. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to get together in person the first time since COVID. And we're really excited as we're going to focus on training excellence. But we are closing registration at midnight Eastern time today. So if you haven't registered, this is your last chance to do it. I really hope that we can see you there. Emma's going to be there as well. It should be a wonderful experience. All right, that's that's enough of promotion for right now. Let's bring Emma back on. And I want to bring Juliana on as well, because I'm curious, Juliana, uh, as a professional dog trainer who deals with lots of clients, do you deal with reactivity very often? Or is that a, a, a small percentage or a large percentage of your caseload? Very large percentage, especially being in the Washington, D.C. area, a city environment, even our suburbs are very dense. We see a ton of reactivity pretty quickly. Once you start getting kind of well-versed in reactivity, I feel like word spreads, you know, and then suddenly all your cases are reactivity. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. So, Emma, my question for you is, how do you make decisions about whether you're going to take on a case or not? and whether or not the click to calm methodology is the right approach. I mean, generally, from my perspective, you can use the click to calm methodology with almost any type of reactivity, but do you take all cases or how do you evaluate the cases you're gonna take on? All cases, only because we don't have a lot of people in my area who do aggression work um, or really intense reactivity work um, my big question always is, is whether my student should see a veterinary behaviorist, which many times I do request that they do that. Um, that way we can work together on, on what we need to teach that dog. Um, so yeah, no, I, I take them all, you know, I, I will take them even if they have done a lot of punishment. Um, I will take them if the dog is still in a prong. You don't want to go down. We move really slowly. So that's good. That's yeah, and it makes sense that you would move slowly and 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 try to, as I said before, meet the learner where they are. I I, I wonder if we could try an experiment today, uh, Emma. Um, my dog Marlin, who's been on this episode on the show many many times, is a really wonderful dog, but he very much responds poorly to people knocking on the door or uh, it's similar to that seeing someone on the other side of the window if he doesn't know somebody he can be very re reactive to it and people might be surprised to find that 
I haven't done anything about it because I really manage the situation. I don't allow him to get exposed to that very much. I'm going to actually change my camera view for a second and let you uh, look at him. He is sleeping. You see him right there. He is oh, asleep. So and and uh, in just a moment, when I finished explaining this, uh, someone is going to knock on the door, which is right through the brown curtain next to him. And I have a feeling he probably will respond pretty aggressively or pretty reactively. Uh, so if we want to focus on him, a uh, camera on him, I'm going to suggest that my confidant who was waiting outside to knock on the door, go ahead and do that right now. And let's see what happens. So as you can see, he, uh, I'm going to open the curtain so you guys can see. He, he's out here barking at the door and, uh, and he probably won't stop unless I do something about it. I'm going to focus in on him just a little bit. Okay. Okay. You have good treats, Ken. Right. I'm going to, first of all, let me, uh, let me tell my, my person they can stop. Okay, thank you so much for your help. You can go now. <laughs> Stick around. We may do something more later. All right. Hey, buddy, come on over here. Hi. How are you doing? Let me uh, make the picture wide again. Yes, yes. You can see he's very in that mode of, of being concerned about it. So what would you, what would you tell a client who, who's dealing with that kind of thing, and how would you begin to start? So what I would do is make sure my client has some really good treats. I do. You have some really good treats, Ken? Yeah, I do. I'm going to go ahead and get some more. I'm using some of our treats. Karen Pryor, we, we, we sell, the Karen Pryor Clicker Training sells these on cue training treats. As you can see, as soon as I get there, yes. he's very attentive because he loves these treats. So, yes, yeah, yeah. so I'm going to have good treats available okay, good. for what next. Yeah. So then what you would do is you would go to the door. So knock again. Okay. Let me, uh, let me get my phone because that's how I'm communicating with people outside. So I'm going to go to the door and should I be You're feeding? Turn the door. Okay. I'm there. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. So um, right now, don't be near the door with him. So leave him there. You come back towards us. Okay. Yeah, just leave him there. Now have that person knock again. And okay, when that don't... person knocks, what I want you to do is... Yep. I'm listening. Uh, when that person knocks, what do I do? Then you're going to start clicking and feeding the door. Gotcha. All right. Go ahead and knock again. Okay. Good. 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 Nice. nice. You're looking at it. Good. Excellent. Good. Good. Should I have the knock again? And then I would. They could if they want. Yeah. Are you clicking, Ken, or are you using a verbal mock? Are you using uh, a verbal mock? I, I am. I am using a. I, I am using a, a clicker ring. It's just. A, it's very soft. You can't hear it. Oh. Good. Good. I love that he's staying sitting because we know that he is thinking, which is great. Good. Good. Now for a little bit. What did you want me to do next? Just come away from the door a little bit. Good. And see. 
Now he's following me. But you, he can do a couple of behaviors. Good. All right. Good. All right. Should I have the person knock again? Yep. And again, you're going to go right with the man. And each time it's going to get a little bit easier to get more um, thinking. Gotcha. Be thinking more and more with each trial. All right. Let's knock again. Let's knock again. Now okay. see if you. Good. Yep. And now see if you can do some hand target. Good, nice. Just wait. Good. Yeah. Cutting through. Uh, um, All right. I think that's pretty good for him. Oops, he got excited again. As soon as I caught, you watching me, buddy? All right, good. All right. Yeah, take him right. with you. Come on, buddy. Let's go this way. Good. Come on this way. Good. You're doing good. You're doing good. Yeah, we get away from that scary. We really had, because that... <laughs> Good. I was just going to say, I mean, that's a pretty mild reactivity um, yeah. piece. Yeah, it was. I'm always looking to manage or teach. So um, if, you know, the dog really couldn't handle it and I couldn't get in with any, like the, then I would have the, um, but I, I kind of want to give, give, audience just to see what the change by doing some other behaviors. So we do know the dog is thinking, which is really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the nice. things that I found just generally with Marlon is once he knows that I'm there, he usually calms down pretty quickly. He's willing to pay attention to me. So his reactivity is not as bad as it used to be, that's for sure. But we've just never really worked right. on it because I control access to my front door and people don't normally just come up and start yeah. knocking on it. All right, I'm going to let him rest a yeah. little bit, Emma. And if, and if, I was just going to say, too, with a lot of the clients, too, um, if the person was to come in the door... You know, there's also protocol for um, doing a hand target to the uh, the this person who's coming in their hand, so that they can actually work with the person that's coming in, so that then the dog is, you know, oh, you're part of the clicker club, cool, and then the dog, you know, then calms down and and looks at that person as a clickable opportunity versus the stranger that's coming in, and I'm not sure what to do. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I'm I'm really glad we got to work on it a little bit. I wasn't sure how he would do. He used to be extremely reactive, but just with time and usually when I'm around, I'm usually able to get him. As you saw, once I started working with him, he wasn't over threshold and he immediately was paying attention to me. But if I left him, he would go back to to barking and stuff. But now he's he's got lost interest in the door and now he's yeah. willing to go back and, and get some rest. So I think that's really really good right and that's the difference right with my clients i mean dogs are going to bark right because dogs bark but the difference is that they like with my guys if they bark i i will just you know look around okay everything's fine and then they say okay just wanted you to know and then i'll go back and lie down yeah. so that's really what the client is looking for can that dog think can we stop that you know that kind of that chain of barking um and go from there. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good point. So that's 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 really excellent. I appreciate us kind of working through that. Um, 
I know that there was some some sound that we lost some of Emma's sound, uh, Juliana. Are there any questions that you think that that now it seems like Emma's sound is is pretty clear again? Um, do you think that are there any questions that have come up that might that you might be able to help clear, clear up anything in particular that people are asking about? Yeah, Missy is wondering why are you feeding right at the door in this exercise? Well, with 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 um, Ken's dog, you know, well, at first I did kind of the baseline to see. And what I was curious about is to see whether or not we could get a thinking dog close to the door. And we could. So that told me that, there, that you know, the reactive wall isn't wasn't, you know, so thick that we couldn't penetrate it. But if I did have a client that I have not worked with before that I know is um, not a trainer per se, I would start back way back from the door and start clicking and feeding the dog for actually looking at the door. Um, but I also was thinking about the example with the window because most dogs, when they go up against the window, I do want the dog to have a little bit of history of getting treats you know, where they are seeing the challenging stimulus, assuming they can handle it. Nice. And the only um, but a lot of times I would have because I'm not sure what my client can honestly do with their dog or what that threshold would be. Any other questions, Juliana, that we think would help clarify the procedure that we just went through that people might have questions about? We've had a few questions to which I would say, let's look at how the behavior trajectory and what happened about giving treats after a dog barks. Are they learning to be rewarded for the barking? You know, I, I can tell you from my own. Um, and that's a question. Yeah. I'm going to say from my own Go perspective, what, what, I, what I have learned about that is that Usually when a dog is barking, they're not thinking about what it is I'm doing. They are so over threshold and so focused on the thing that's going on that when I can get him to look at me, he isn't being reinforced for barking. He's being reinforced for looking at me. And although barking is taking place, that barking is happening on a, on a, on a much more gutter, guttural level that he doesn't necessarily connect it to. I don't find a dog going, oh, if I bark, bark, bark. I can, uh, I can get treats. That could happen if we repeated it over and over again the same way. But my tendency would be is I was using the treats to see, to get his attention so that then he quit barking when he was paying attention to me and I could get other behavior. And that's what Emma, I think, meant when she was saying, you can see that you've poking holes through that wall. He is now thinking. And so, um, yes, I think you should be careful about reinforcing barking, doing it the same way over and over and over again. But that's why there's more steps that Emma would take me through to get me past that. And I'm not really too concerned about that. It's a, there, it's a separate process that's going on. One of them is a, a classical conditioning, uh, subconscious level learning that's going on. And the other is the more conscious operant level learning that's taking place. They're separate things and they, they don't necessarily conflict with each other, but they do work hand in hand. Joshua, my he did not want us to touch his. Well, I totally understand that that line of thinking, but um, classical conditioning always sits on your shoulder. And recently, so now I feel really good about saying this. Recently, um, now that it's become very muddy, he wipe his feet, and I remember like a. and trying to bite him but i was shoving charlie bears in his face and he would like crunch 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 and there'd be charlie bears all over the place but i had and and so if you saw me doing it you would say oh my gosh she's feeding that dog for biting and trying to you know nip at his hand um but i will tell you i just kept doing it kept doing it kept doing it now he lets us wipe all of his feet without any treats at all so now i That's feel good about saying that <laughs> No, no, that's great. It's that's not where really I want great. To start. No. But well, I tell you what, let's sometimes let's, you let's, have to go to the vent. 
Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I want to take some more questions, but I also want to do a few other things. Let's take another quick commercial break. One of the things that I think is challenging for a lot of people is, of course, the sound is going in and out, and we keep trying to fix that. But I do want to tell you about a brand new course that we're offering at uh, Karen Pryor Academy. It is uh, the Click to Calm for Instructors, Solutions for Dog Reactivity and Aggression. It is based on Emma's book, The New Click to Calm, but it's an opportunity to, for you as a, as a professional dog trainer to increase your confidence by building confidence in the click to calm methodology. I know it's hard to hear all of the details of it here. And even if we had perfect sound, we wouldn't be able to cover it all in the short hour that we have. The new click to calm course for instructors allows you to have a great online learning experience that includes one-on-one -on -one Zoom coaching sessions and loads of additional support from Emma herself. So if you're interested in finding out about the course, we just launched the course this month. It's a brand new course. And if you wanna find out more about, about the course, you can go to karenpryoracademy.com and look at all the information we have about this course. And that would be a wonderful way to learn more about this procedure. And of course, getting a hold of the book, The New Click to Calm is another great way to learn more about the procedure. So let's, Let's uh, come back to uh, talking a little bit with, with both uh, Emma and Juliana and get some questions as well. Um, I guess I wanna find out a little bit more about your reaction to this course. You have been working with the KPA team, Emma, for well over a year now to create this new course. And now that the course is launched, I know you've had a lot of students start the course already. Um, uh, tell yeah. us a little bit. Are you excited about this course? Is it is it is it something that you've been wanting to do for a while? It is. It's something I've been wanting to do forever. Um, only because um, for like when I go into a client's home, I want to work on not just that piece of reactivity or aggression issue, but there's so many other things that surround that issue. You know, things like how the client and their dog communicate. Um, cause I know they all love their dog, but my question always is, does the dog take cues from you? You know, does the dog know what to do in your house? Does the dog have choices in the house and how do you help that dog make the right choices? Um, so there's so many other things because, you know, I'm always amazed by when you show a dog what you want or, or you, um, you know, teach a dog that, you know what, when you're in this situation, you can do this instead and get reinforcement. So many dogs choose that option. So um, what I'm happy about is we go through the, you know, that relationship building part of it. We go through, you know, uh, the basic foundation behaviors, because I got to tell you, a lot of my clients' dogs, some of them don't even know how to sit. Um, emergency behaviors, what happens if the unexpected happens? How are they going to deal with that? Um, and then, of course, the methodologies, whether it's with, you know, dogs to people, whether it's dog to dogs. And then there's a section in there on uh, multi-dog households. But I love that I can really help shape the student to see all these pieces, because that is what really makes up a true, um, how would you, I don't, I never want to say cure, because this right. is something that the, you know, the clients will work on, but they can work on it and see a lot of new things that that dog can bring. And it's so exciting when you see people for the first time starting to understand that their dog's actually listening to them and they actually can communicate, which is really, really awesome. So um, I love that. And the other part of it is, you know, the students are sending me videos of them training. And again, we look for those nice clean training loops. That's the other thing I'm looking at, not just what we're working on, but also what's the approach? How clean is that training loop? No. Um, because the cleaner the training loops, the quicker the dogs will learn and the more straightforward that communication is going to be. And um, I love it. Like I love, I just love, 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 love having students to myself. that I can, you know, we can walk through this with. Um, yeah. Well, I tell you, we at Karen Pryor Academy are, yeah, we at Karen Pryor Academy are really excited to have the course in our in our catalog because I know there's a lot of requests for 
help in dealing with reactive dogs. And I think you're the perfect person to help coach them. And uh, I, I, I think that is great. One of the things that I think comes up a lot when you're dealing with reactivity cases is that uh, that difficulty in finding the right reinforcer that's going to work when you're dealing with reactivity. Um, and how do you deal with that? I, I, I Clearly not all, like you, you're, you're gonna have dogs that are over threshold and that are not gonna respond to, to food in some ways. Uh, are there ways of building good reinforcers so that, uh, that your dog can be really ready to deal with the challenges of, a, of, a, of a distractions? Yeah, so, um, so if the dog is not, you know, food motivated, um, well, I shouldn't say food motivated. It's just that they, you know, they're, they're, they don't, they just can't take that food when all of this is happening. I give my students um, some little games to play. And because I think back to when I was working with Ben and, you know, the clicker, like I remember, and you're not supposed to do this, so I don't recommend doing it. But I remember I was in a really sticky situation and a woman with a dachshund kept, kept coming to me and I kept saying, no, Ben cannot say hi to your dog, et cetera, et cetera. And I didn't really have food on me because I wasn't ready. And as he started to explode, I actually clicked him. And the minute I clicked him, he looked up at me to, as almost as to say, okay, well, where's my reinforcement? So I thought, you know, if I have some students whose dogs cannot use the clicker, how about using a word? How about using a word that we really back, put a lot of reinforcement history into that word so that in a sticky situation, or maybe instead of saying yes or whatever, because um, maybe they've been doing that and it hasn't been all that well, I play this little game with them that I actually got from Kay Lawrence. It's a si super simple game, but what we were doing is taking like little pieces of treats. Are you ready? You ready? 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 Excited about it. So I have you help. So I've had students do that for about a week, and then let's say go back to the window. And then as the whatever's happening outside the window, the, the client says, are you ready? And the dog turns around right away, expecting a treat to go flying. So not only are we feeding it, but you have to remember if you're using food and you need to up that reinforcement value of the food, you certainly can raise the level of the food, but you also can pair a really exciting, fun activity that the dog likes as well. And that gives more oomph to that reinforcement. So let me just make sure I'm gonna restate what I think, what I understood you to say. So when you're, 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 you're getting your dog excited, you maybe have some kind of a treat that the dog really likes and you're showing it to them, you're going, are you ready, are you ready, are you ready? And then eventually at some point you then, flip that treat off and then they go chasing after yes. it. And what you've done yeah. is you started to condition them that that ready, are you ready? is a reinforcer in itself. It gets them all amped up to be able to go get this other yes. reinforcer. And, and how do you yes. use that in a reactive situation or, or is it just a, a game to help create better re new reinforcers? Yeah, I mean, it's a game to, to create a new and a powerful reinforcer. Um, and then, what, you know, if they're out in, I don't know, some dog starts unexpectedly comes in front of them, they can say, are you ready? And they can turn the other way and move, right? Because the dog, they hear ready and they're so pumped up hearing that, that verbal that they, they immediately withdraw their attention. I'll tell you one way I used it um, that was really effective is with Austin because he's, you know, he's 11 now and he's pretty much retired. But early, a couple of years ago at the start line, he, he started to get a little more, um, not slow. I mean, he would go, but I thought, oh, you know, I feel like he's lacking the motivation. Once he started going, he'd rip around. But I think he was getting a little stressed at the start line. So I did this ready game with him. So I'd go to the start line. I say, are you ready? And of course, he'd say, and then he'd lean forward and I'd say, go, you know, and he would just, I mean, book it. And he was so happy. Like it's his favorite game in the entire world. So you can use that with reactivity as well. And to help the dogs cut through that anxiety from whatever environment you're in. 
Hey, do you think, um, I know we've had a little bit of difficulty with your other camera, but do you think you could set up this camera so you, we could watch you play that ready game with, uh, with uh, yeah. uh, Spirit? Spirit. She loves this game. You're going to see her do okay. all kinds of cr crazy things because I'm going to do the, let's see. Um, can, all right. Can you see her? Yes. I'm going to go back over there. Yeah, I think we'll be able to see her good over there. And just understand that when you're walking into the, when you're back in the back working with her, we probably will not be able to hear you very well. So why don't you just play the game and then we'll talk about it when you get back to the camera. Okay. Just know one thing, when I'm down there going like this, I'm saying, are you ready? Are you going to flick it? Okay, good. That's helpful. All right. Uh-oh, it looks like her camera froze. Let's see if it unfreezes. Or, or will she come back and the game already be done? Oh, there she is. She's down there playing. So I think what, 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 what we didn't really see really well, though, is you're down there get, saying, ready, ready. The dog gets really excited. Then you flick it forward, and then she goes off and chases it. And what that's doing is you're creating yes. that ready word as a really strong reinforcer, something that you can use in other situations. Is She's backing up and getting all excited, and they love yeah. that. Yeah. And you know what's yeah, really a cool? No, I was just going to say what's really cool is you have dogs who up until that point are so worried all the time. And then you play a little game like this and the clients just sit there and go, oh, my gosh, I didn't know that they could get that excited. No, you that's, that's so that's, you just see these dogs come alive. Well, that's really excellent. Really cool. Yeah, no, it, no, it, it really, it really is. And curious, Juliana, do you use like, any kind of games like that, uh, or, 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 or anything similar in in your work with uh, reactivity cases? So there's something that I've been starting to do lately. It's very, very similar, but it's ready. Get it? And I wasn't sure. Were you saying a cue when you tossed the treat? Yes, yes. You probably couldn't hear me. Okay, so and my guess is, you know, these these um, games. You said you got it from Kay Lawrence. Like, I'm guessing somebody got it from Kay Lawrence, and then it because I certainly oh, did yeah, not yeah. come up with it. But I, I <laughs> yeah, I didn't come up with it. Um, and I don't know that she came. I'm not sure who came right. up with it, but I know um, she had a play course. You know, playing all these different games. Mm -hmm. So when I did these games with my dogs, I did it with the intent of using it with my clients. And it's just, it's so funny how, you know, it's kind of like the hand target. You know, if I teach my client um, how to, for their dog to target their hand, you think I taught them <laughs> the most remarkable thing in the entire world, right? Um, that's the type of things I want to bring my clients mm -hmm. because they now look at their dogs with new eyes and a new understanding. And that's what keeps them loyal to their dogs and no longer wanting to bring them to the shelter, let's say. Mm -hmm. So those are those things I look for. Um, Cause you know, reactivity, aggression, that's th those topics are really hard and heavy. Yeah. So when I can have them play and get the dog excited, it's a win-win for both. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that I like about the click to call methodology is you really teach a lot of really basic things. You're not, mm -hmm. it's not like this massively difficult procedure. It's a lot of small basics that when you teach right. the dog, and put them together in the right way helps you manage and deal with reactivity in an effective way. Juliana, do we have any questions that that, that people uh, have have been asking that we could pose to Emma while we before we run out of time? So we saw the reactivity training with the door and the window, and people were asking about leash reactivity, which I I just want to clarify is what most of the course is about is the leash reactivity. It, um, or some it, of it. Well, least. it, yeah, some of it. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is a complete program where we, we do, you know, the reactivity on the leash reactivity in the house. You have, you know, dogs who, um, are nervous with people. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, you really, it, you it, really do try to approach 
all, all different, different types of reactivity right. and right. different ways of approaching it, which is really the nice thing about the click to calm approach is that you yes. are able to utilize these smaller, easy to learn component pieces that you put together in a way that helps you deal with different types of reactivity, uh, no matter whether it's really big or really small, you 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 try to build your students' uh, skill set up so that they have these right. component pieces to put together. Right. Yeah, my I loved I watched your webinar at Clicker Expo Live. I loved how systematic it was. I know that was only a glimpse into what you do in Click to Calm, mm -hmm. but man, there right. is something about a system and an easy step, yes. one, two, three, go to the next step, amazing. Yes, because you know, it's not even, you know, the dogs want steps. Mm -hmm. The dogs want predictability, the dogs want patterns in systems, because if you do that, you take out the uncertainty. Dogs that are uncertain are anxious. So if you can take things one step at a time, the dog knows what to expect and then they're they're happy with it and you can do more and more and more things with them so yes yeah. I, I i try to have that and it's good for the clients as well because it's easy to understand but it's really important for the dogs but yeah i think we have time for one last question before we are our hour is almost up juliana but uh, is there a, one last question for emma so viewers noticed that obviously this wonderful exercise we saw, the dog had already started barking and then, you know, can intervene and you talk about how you intervene. Do you have exercises or what exercises do you have where you're working under threshold where the dog has not yet started reacting? Can you talk a little bit about those? Well, I will tell you that I all, all give a little bit of both there right but yeah so typically what i would do is the um the dog on a leash i would have the dog farther back and i would have the if the when the dog looks at the person in the door and i actually wouldn't start with the doorbell i would just have the person there behind the door and then when the dog notices we would click we would back up and feed the dog um depending upon how reactive the dog was we would either um, give the dog many treats on the floor, usually hard so that they can crunch and chew, and look and crunch and chew and look. And then we would do our next exposure. The reason why I like them backing up is because I want to keep them both threshold and I want to see, can this dog do another trial? If the dog can, then we do it again. We do it again. And again, little by little, you can get closer and closer to the door. Um, and that's with some door. And again, it changes, you know, if the, if the student wanted the dog to not go to the door, there's a protocol for teaching the dog that the doorbell is the cue to go to their safe space. That's another piece of it. Or if the, you know, or if the person wants, um, their visitor to come in, then again, we can do that, that person involved in a way that makes basic foundation behaviors. You know, what, what behaviors does that dog find reliable? And can we cue it from a distance? Can that person now become part of the curriculum? So there's all these just different ways um, of kind of coming in. But with dogs that, you know, really like Ben, who there really was no way, or like Joshua, sometimes you just got to classically condition it to get in there got to kind of get in through the back door. And now I feel confident about that because I actually found that it works really well. Well, I, I think I think uh, that's so. one of the, yeah, I think that's one of the great things about what you have done Emma is you you've taken your own personal experience and and you didn't come at this as a science, you came at it as a practical trainer and then after years of dealing with your own reactivity case and then dealing with your clients reactivity cases really refined and developed a, a methodology that has been very successful right. and I know many people who have followed it I've followed it myself and have found it very very useful so I really appreciate you sharing uh, 
this with us today. I know we had some technical difficulties, but I really encourage people at the very start, at the very least, I encourage you to get this book. And I encourage you to look into eventually perhaps taking the KPA course online where you get Emma's personalized instruction. I think it's, it's, it's a terrific way to go. So Emma, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I also want to remind everybody that, uh, thank you so much. I want to remind everybody that Emma and Juliana are both uh, KPA faculty members. And I want to remind you that if you are interested in becoming a certified dog trainer yourself, you can go to the KarenPryorAcademy.com website and learn about the more than 20 upcoming locations all around the world. In very near future, we've got new application deadlines for uh, a a DTP, a dog trainer professional workshop in Canberra, Australia, one in Endicott, New York, Magnolia, Texas, Nashville, Tennessee, Squim, Washington, and so many more. So certainly look into that if that is something that interests you. I want to thank all of you for coming out today and want to tell you that next month we have another really exciting ex episode and we are promising to get our technical issues worked out. Uh, Laura Monica Torelli is going to be a guest with us again. She's been on live from the ranch before and everybody gets excited when she starts sharing some of her tips for canine cooperative care. So she's going to show us some wonderful tips for working with our dogs and preparing them for a variety of different medical procedures, things that you can do yourself, things that you can do at home to really help. This Live from the Ranch episode is always the very first Thursday of the month, which in April will be the 6th of April, and it's at 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Um, East Coast time, 9 p.m. London. Try to catch it if you can. We are so appreciative of everybody being here. And if you have suggestions for other guests or other things that you'd like to see on Live from the Ranch, you can visit our website, uh, go to the Ranch website, and go to the tab that says watch live and there you can fill out a form that shares your comments your suggestions if you have videos that you'd like to share with us we will do that from time to time we love seeing your submissions and we enjoy putting together live from the ranch for your enjoyment just one last reminder if you've been watching today we have several wonderful um offers and discounts and promotions that we wanted to feature. We talked about all three of these. Uh, get certified as a professional dog trainer with KPA, uh, the Click to Calm for Instructors, a brand new course that Emma is offering through KPA. We're really excited about this course. We hope you look into it. And finally, today is the final day to register for Clicker Expo in Washington, DC. This Clicker Expo promises to be unlike any other. We're gonna focus on training excellence. We have a huge, wonderful slate of instructors, including Emma Parsons, who will be joining us for that expo. I hope to see all of you there. That's all for this month. Happy training. We'll see you in April. Bye-bye.